You got two minutes. I didn't get your slides uploaded. I'm sorry. I'm going to try to reload that you. I was just going to mention that. Yeah. I think that I'm going to accept the errata. Oh, okay. If you can upload the slides, that would be cool. If you got, whatever. Did you send them to her too? Yes. You're not first, are you? Oh, I can probably find it. I don't think I'm on the agenda. For your slides? No, no, there's something else. Oh. No. I don't think so. All right, I need to take a deep breath. There they are. That's what I, I tell her. Yep. I got them. I did not. Oh, that's okay. I can move fast. You don't even know. Oh, is it time? Well, it says time. Two people, two more minutes. Oh, we got a minute. Okay. Oh, wow. Good afternoon, everybody. Looks like everything's sort of selling out. So welcome to the second hour of or the third hour of DNS Op. Um, Tim, Suzanne, you know us. If you don't, all et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and Paul, there's Paul. Say hi, Paul. And there's another Paul. Um, Paul's going to take minutes. Um, Dan, could you jab scribe a little bit? We'll, yeah, just, he, he, we'll just make sure that we'll move through this kind of quickly. Um, you know this, no well. Well, the blue sheets, oh man. Yeah. So I'm on, okay. It's warming up. I'm basically onto the slide that talks about the blue sheets. And the blue sheets, sheets so. have already been released. Yeah, the blue sheets are out there in the wild. So um, quickly, where's Mr. Lawrence? Raise your hand, Mr. Lawrence, so I can see you. I can't see Mr. Okay. So there's a gentleman from, and Mr. Edmonds, is he, okay, sorry, I didn't mean to scare you, but um, there's a gentleman from Time, Jason, where are you, I talked to, um, who has an interesting CDN DNS problem that I think the two of you, um, he would like to pick your brains a little bit. So I talked to him and I said, I think you need to find the smarter people, and those are the, you two, so I apologize for that. So, um, <laughs> so you know the blue sheets. Um, this I hope so quick Jenna bashing it's time for the bad idea fairy so they come, you know so if you remember Andrew's slide from who knows where so um, wow <laughs> this this is really kind of burned me out so we we had a discussion I know talk about that I yeah this end of the day it's uh, my brains a little fried um, we had a discussion this morning with some ADs and some of the working group chairs about the DNS, the various transport things, and Warren suggested a new working group, basically called DNS over new transport, or don't. <laughs> so, so I, I got to give Warren big props for that. Thank you, Warren. We so, figure, we figure if that one is chartered, oh, we're okay. done with the acronym game in the IETF forever. Yeah, we exactly. win <laughs> because that way is, all the drafts can say IETF don't DNS dot dot dot. You do realize that if we get uh, a, a working group in from dispatch for DNS over HTTP, it's going to be called DOE. No. <laughs> DOE. <laughs> I think it will, and actually. Bonus points for involving both DNS and transport. Exactly. So rather than you know HTTP over DNS and stuff like that, here's our agenda. Um, more, um, Wes has got a little talk about multi-responses and multi-queue types. We talked about this. And we spent a lot of time trying to remember what, what meaning that was, if that was Berlin last year or, or um, um, Argentina, and I'm still kind of confused. Peter is going to speak about XPF for Ray. Is that correct? Yep. Um, I have to tell your boss that you get a gold star. Um, Warren's got extended error. 
there's client ID, DNS capabilities. Robert's got one slide that I made for him. I'm first going to make um, DNSSEC validate requirements. And actually, the algorithm one, Schumann's at the bottom of this, and for some reason, it's hurting me. So what we're looking for is basically, in these discussions, kind of think of it as lightning talks, right? Are they worth adopting? Do they need work? Are they like, no way, go away kind of thing? And we're not looking for large architectural pounding reasons, you know, at the mic, but just like, yes, like, needs more work, support, you know, whatever, that kind of stuff. Because, you know, and that stuff, you know, we can throw it through the mailing list. But we just want to get that sense of, should we start, you know, here's our pile of stuff that we're thinking about, you know, moving forward, people are very, you know, seem interested in, where are we going with it, right? So that's basically it. I got some slides from Warren about the TLS um, usage. I'll throw them up right now, and then it'll be on to Mr. Hardiker sort of thing. So thanks. Thank you. What's that? Where are these? Buddy? Yep. So Warren, you said one client went a little crazy. Yeah, it looks a little. Where is Warren? Oh, Warren's hiding. It's okay. Oh, that's the spike that you were talking. Is that the spike you were talking about? Oh. Yep. Yeah. Yay, pretty pictures. Uh, we're, we'll upload them. Um, just sort of showing the TLS or usage, the DNS usage, and the TLS usage. And, and yep. And we're going to let Warren speak because he is the AD and he has to. Look, they're pretty graphs. They're yeah. pretty graphs that show stuff. Okay. What I actually wanted to say is we have an open errata on 8078, um, which I'm not completely sure the conversation ever converged. If people wouldn't mind having another look and commenting. To me, it looks like the errata should be accepted, but a little bit more feedback would be good. That's all. Okay. Wes. Clicky thing. Clicky thing. I need a click. I also need a microphone at a reasonable level. All right. Um, so really briefly, I'm going to go over sort of two concepts that we've talked about. We talked about them not at the last IETF, at the one before that, and, and a decision was never really made about what to do with them. And I'm, I am not clicking. No, oh, that's nice. <laughs> technology these days. It's ruining all my jokes, darn it. <laughs> all right, so um, both this one and if I could go back to the title page, the Q-type document and the multiple responses document. Um, they're both solving two different problems. So um, is Ray Bellis in the room? No. He's okay. He's remote. And unfortunately, because he helped off of these slides and he doesn't know it. All right, so next. Okay. <laughs> well, it's, it's actually painfully breaking us, isn't it? All right. So back in the good old days, in like the early 1900s, clients would like use anything that you sent at them. And that included anything in the additional section. So they would take it, and as a good leap of faith, they said, you know, the internet in the early days was all trustworthy and nobody bad existed. So yay. Next. Then along came the dark and dreary Middle Ages, where cash poisoning plagued the land. And the additional section, all the code was rewritten so that the additional section was like just dropped. If it wasn't useful, if it wasn't in zone, even if it was in zone, but not what you were expecting, it was tossed out. Next. Enter DNSSEC, it's a new era and, and everything can be happy-go-lucky again because we can actually validate that those records are valid. And it's not even just DNSSEC. So some more recent code bases, including, uh, according to Mark, you know, more recent versions of Bind actually will accept some records as long as they're related. So if you know, if you had a, if you asked for M MX and it gave you back an A record for the MX, you know, it was all happy donkey, and that's about what you were going to ask for anyway. But that's not the, you know, that doesn't always happen. So uh, th these two documents kind of fix that problem. Next. So two things, there's two different problem cases, which is the thing I want you to take away from today. Two problems, not one, or two optimizations. Some is when you have a smart client. The client actually knows ahead of time it needs more information. It might need to look up both an A and a quad A, the quintessential example. It might need to look up, 
If it's going to send you mail, it's not just going to send you mail and ask for the MX record, it's also going to ask for your NS record if it hasn't been there before. So it's probably going to ask for both, right? Multiple queue types, that document is what lets you do a smart client area. So they're saying, I need like 15 queue types. Who knows what they're going to ask for? Next. <laughs> yeah, sorry. That's okay, it's my fault. So the other possibility is that, that the client actually has no clue what to ask for. It's, it's starting a whole chain of stuff and it's going to ask some question first and then that's going to follow on and you know it's going to come back later and ask more questions. It could be because there's application specific knowledge and there's no way in the world the DNS protocol knows it ahead of time. It's not possible. So this is the multiple responses draft which is that, so when I say R draft, I should have changed that to multiple responses. I originally wrote this from a single point of context. Um, so this is when the server has a better idea than you do of what you might need. So for example, if you go to www.example.com, there's a decent chance you're going to come back and look up images.com and javascript.com and you know, who knows what, um, especially if you're doing you know, lots of uh, round robbing mixing with names. Um, if you ask for the example MX, you might actually come back and ask for the TLSA record later on as well if you're doing Dane, for example. And that's not something that, that a, current web, a current name server will ever include in the additional section at this point. So next. So if we compare these two different um, drafts, they're, they're actually solving completely different use cases. So, you know, in both cases, the client indicates desire. There's a bit in the EDNF0 field. There's, in both drafts, there's a way for the client to say, I want this, you don't just get it for free automatically. Um, in the multiple responses case, the client doesn't request specifics. The client actually just says, I, I'm clueless, please help me out and give me additional information if you can. And in the Q-types draft, the client actually says, I want as much information for this name as you can, or I want these Q-types. In uh, for the server selects the specific in the multiple responses case, again, that's the opposite, where the server is saying, you know, you asked for this extra stuff, I'm going to give you a bunch of stuff all within zone. Um, both of them support multiple Q-types. They can both return multiple Q-types for an answer. Um, and additional multiple responses, because it's, you know, a little bit more on the intelligence side from the server, can also give you different names back that you didn't even ask for. Um, that's not possible with Q-types because that's out of scope of that work. They both use EDNS zero to signal support. Next. So, oh, that ruins the joke too. Stop. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I, That's okay. Go on to the next one. <laughs> and then make the cursor go away. We believe in really basic technology around wow. here. This, this is awesome. <laughs> End of the week. It's our so, the important thing to note is that the happy eyeballs that you see down at the bottom, these are both optimizations, right? These are both happy eyeball type problems. You know, does the world work without them? Yes. They are optimization mostly to do happy eyeballs type stuff on both, uh, both proposals. Next. Last one. <laughs> All right, so that's an overview of what they both are. Note that I didn't go into the gory details, right? This is, this is about the concept of solving the problem. And, you know, these how many people have read um, the multiple responses draft? Excellent. How many people have read the multiple Q, the Q type draft? Excellent. All right, so there's a lot of basis for understanding for these. Now the question is, what do we want to do with them as yeah. the working group? And I will turn that you to want you to, guys. Do you want to do a, a quick comment on whether or not either one should be? No. Yes, no. Yes. I'm letting you. Anybody it. really love this or really hate it? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> That's the best. Uh, okay. Back to the pink box. Wait, okay, okay, Paul. <laughs> Um, so Five Paul, seconds, go. Paul Hoffman, I like both, and I in, currently think both can actually go forwards. I think that'll confuse implementers and things like that, but I think that they're actually both stand on their own. Okay. Thank you. Shane Kerr, I, I love the multi Q types, and I have no problem at all with the multi responses. Yeah, I, I hate both. And I have two things. I mean, have we ever seen that there was really uh, stuff on clients do, do uh, done that kind of do new stuff like how many the OBC. One of the things we see with a lot of these ideas is we have no data and there's a lot of caching in browsers, there's a lot of caching in resolvers. I mean, is this really a problem? Because I don't think so. Well, so that's what I, that's one of what the happy eyeballs existed on the screen, right? This is an optimization, not in the same way that, that all of the, it, that the entire happy eyeballs RFC is not a problem, right? 
it was just to make clients happier. Have we any chance to really have that input? Because you you propose it as a uh, client stop resolver to resolver thing. My understanding is that uh, the drafts are actually also covering the other side. And I think on both sides, there's no real kind of need for that because caching does all of it. Caching works if it's a popular site. Okay. Yes. No. Thank you, Andre. Uh, David Lawrence, I wanted to say, actually, I love multi, my name is on multi-responses, <laughs> and uh, my name is not on multi queue types, but at the hackathon, I started an implementation for ISC's bind because I really believe in it that much. Oh. It should go out. So, Andre Suri, um, I'm actually indifferent, uh, but I think your slide's missing the smart attacker. And so, unless you have a really good defense uh, for bloating the responses then I don't think it's a, such a good idea to bloat the answers again because we're, we're trying to minimize them in past few years um, I couldn't hear all that I think you were saying yeah. that you didn't fully understand the difference between the two is that no no, no I was saying that uh, you're missing a slide with smart attacker attacker ah yeah so no we don't describe why DNSSEC is sort of helpful or nicer yeah so we don't we also don't have a slide on on the children no, no, no. I mean so, for for DDoS so reflection, reflection attack ethics. right so we have plenty of those already in the system you're right and at one point we even put in to the multiple responses one that TCP was required and then we took that out based on knowledge but so that's a that is a detail of which we can yeah, solve in the working group once it's adopted once the problem is in scope yeah let's but, let's but, move the substantive discussion to, okay. to the Two comments. Uh, if we want to do any optimizations in this space, what do we want to do, is the question. And second, uh, if we're going to open it up, I'm sure there will be other ideas coming along. Oh. So I think it's premature to make any adoption choices at this point. Well, so both of these have been around for quite a while, so I'm surprised there hasn't been other ideas that they have triggered. But oh, he's got one. I'll leave that to the chairs. <laughs> yeah. I have an experiment going on that will result in a draft in the next couple of weeks. Uh, my name is Andrew Sullivan, and uh, I, I agreed with just about everything you were saying until you said this is merely an optimization. Um, these are optimizations, that part I agree with, but actually they are optimizations that change uh, a, a bunch of the architectural assumptions about the DNS. Now, maybe we should do that, but I think that that analysis has been part of the thing that has been missing. And, and maybe we need to have a, a, a focused discussion about that because both of these things, right, they change like uh, what you can expect from caches and all the rest of it. I, I know that they, they try to deal with um, some of those things, but they, they, it really is a fundamental change to, to the assumptions about the system. And I don't think that analysis has been written down anywhere. So I think that's, that's actually the first step. Paul Valkos. Um, I also like both, um, and uh, we already have a use case for the unbound IPsec module that currently sends two queries in parallel and would be awesome if it could be one query. Um, I would also, maybe these two uh, record, these two drafts can also help sort of simplify or more standardize the alias or A name uh, proposals that have been around so that we have less special processing and they, they can use these generic mechanisms. Okay, no comment. <laughs> There are many other ideas, and uh, for example, uh, draft Yao a compiling question is well written, I think, and there are many another ideas. So uh, we, we, uh, I would like to compare all of them. Okay. Yeah. These are the two active documents, and I strongly encourage anybody that wants to write a solution for this space to do so soon. Yeah. So it's, Dan, you are proxying two uh, comments from the Jabber Room. First, Ray Bellis was on um, objecting to Oliver's comment, saying we had this discussion in Berlin. And he also said, please ask Andrew to send an email to the list explaining his comment. And then the second one is from, um, I'm going to mess this up, but uh, uh, Mukund Sivaraman from ISC. I'm sorry if I slaughtered your name, but um, he said that uh, uh, he prefers smart clients to smart servers. EDNS client subnet only works on stuff in the answer section. 
Smart servers can have a performance impact, additional internal data structure queries having a big impact on performance, and it's better if the client requests what it wants and the server provides that than guessing what the client may need that the client may end up throwing away. Okay. I'm closing the mic line. Chip. Just in case anybody else was having an urge to get up. Closed. <laughs> Chip. No, Chip I closed the mic line, sorry. This was supposed to be a five yeah. 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 I think both ideas are worth exploring further, but I would also hope we can try and get some data or objective data to measure which of these optimizations is likely to be the better if they're if they are if they're orthogonal to each other. But before we do it, I think before we actually go to the good get these to the final stage in the working group, we really should have something that's based on objective data that will give us an indication as to whether the, the, the gain from doing this is actually worth the effort. And I seem to remember back in Berlin last year when Warren was doing something similar to multiple responses. It might still be the same thing we've got now. Is that, that there was a promise then we would actually get some data at that particular stage, and I don't think we've ever got that yet. Matt Poundset, um, I, I like the ideas behind both of these drafts, and I'm sort of amazed that has, this didn't occur to me before. Maybe other people have thought about it. Um, I didn't think about it until I saw both the, the feature sets side by side, but. I'm kind of curious now if there isn't a way to do both of these things in a single change rather than two different drafts. I, it, so literally off the top of my head. But. Yeah, no, I mean, the, the, I think that was one of the things that was confusing in, in Berlin or wherever the previous discussion was. But the reality is, is that there are two very different cases. One, it's who has the knowledge. And in one case, it's the client. In one case, it's the server. So um, they'd be kind of hard to combine. Note that I didn't answer any technical questions because we're going to table that and the chairs are going to do whatever yeah. they're going to do now. Thank you. And next is, I guess, Peter. Yeah. Do you have the clicky thing, Wes? Oh, yes. I think I got the clicky thing working. So, okay. Sorry. Yeah, I know. Hello. Um, I'm Peter van Dijk of PowerDNS. Um, this is uh, Ray Bellis' XPF draft for which uh, Remy and I have become co-authors. Um, if you read this draft before, be aware that it has changed substantially since the previous version. So who, who has read this version? Five hands, very good. So what this draft does, suppose you have some middle box in front of your DNS server. Um, the DNS server loses client information and this draft fixes this. When Ray named the draft, he mistakenly thought that the similar HTTP header was called exproxied for. It's called exforwarded for. Um, we may need to fix this if we go to publication, so it makes more sense. So to provide some context, um, long ago, but not long, long ago, DNS looked like this. You had some machines at home. You had a router. The router forwarded your query either through NATs or as a simple forwarder to a resolver. Resolver spoke to an authoritative, you got an answer back. Um, pretty soon CDNs came up and this wasn't enough, so we added EDNS client subnet, which allows the authoritative to see at least part of the client IP address. Then people started doing even more complex things, putting load balancers in front of their resolvers, or today, for example, a DNS over TLS unwrapper. This means the resolver no longer has the client IP address. It only has the IP of the low balancer or the DLS unwrapper, which, which might even be on localhost. So this is where XPF comes in. The load balancer adds a meta record to the query and forwards, to, forwards, forwards it to the resolver, which can then add EDNS client subnet information as before. Uh, now suppose the authoritative also has a load balancer uh, suppose a query comes in without EDNS client subnet, then the authoritative would still want to know the IP of the resolver asking the question. So again, XPF comes in here uh, to clarify these are the boundaries of these extra messages or extra options. Each uh, option is generated on the leftmost machine in a box and it is removed on the rightmost machine in a box. So XPF never leaves a network. It might, might not even leave a machine, while EDNS client subnet will most definitely leave your uh, autonomous system and go from the access provider to a CDN. 
Um, and to clarify, uh, David Lawrence is gonna present client ID later. Uh, this is the box for client ID. It is, add, it, is, it is added on the home CPE. It travels no farther than the resolver. This is what uh, Meta RR looks like. The previous draft version made it an EDNS option, but we re realized that this would make, make TSIG very hard. So now that it is a separate Meta RR in the additional section, it is very easy to ignore while uh, generating your TSIG message for verification. The IP version is a four or a six, like in an IP header, so it's four bits. The protocol is the protocol number from the IANA protocol registry, so TCP or UDP. Uh, I did just realize that the QUIC is not in there yet, so I hope it will be one day. And then you have the source address, which is an obvious use case for this, but also the destination address and the source and destination ports. This allows the uh, authoritative or resolver that is behind the proxy to still apply views or ACLs, etc. The source port is in there, so you can distinguish different clients in CGNet situations. The destination port is in there, so you can distinguish plain DNS from DNS over TLS, for example. Next steps, um, I'd like to ask for adoption, and uh, we need to get some code running. Today, a DNS dist does the same thing, but using EDNS client subnet which confuses matters if EDNS client subnet is also actually in use for its normal purposes. Uh, so XPF is specifically, specifically designed to be able to coexist with it. Okay. Any Love questions? it, hate it, both. <laughs> <laughs> A little contention problem. Okay. Um, this is Andre again. Um, uh, why not EDN zero option? I, I haven't found that in draft. Why? Why? The the previous version was an EDN zero option, but if there is a T6 signature over the query, and you are putting another option in the option record, then validating the signature becomes more complex. It's more pointer magic or whatever you like to call it. This is simpler. In general, you put it at the end. In general, the authoritative or resolver will find it at the end and just remove it and then do TSIC processing. It's not impossible as an option, but this seems okay, simple. I understand, but I still don't like it. Um, can I start by correcting you on one thing? We didn't add client subnet. EDS client subnet is not an IETF standard. It was documented as informational. Um, so, um, and it's an example of, I think, kind of protocol development that we should be doing differently now. So I see the use case for this, obviously, but I've said this before that I think this violates a couple of principles. And one is it makes pervasive monitoring easier. We're supposed to be mitigating that in protocol design. And the other is that this is directly injecting metadata into these queries. So, my main uh, request about this is that the, the document is framed differently. It starts from saying, here's a use case, here's a new option. Oh, and by the way, there are some privacy concerns and you shouldn't use this in places you're not supposed to. Yeah, yeah there, like there are some words in that, but yeah, we, we, I don't think we have an actual privacy consideration section yet, There's, and we, we definitely should. There, there is one, but it's very, very small. Okay. It's throwaway. It's slightly inaccurate because it references the wrong RFC. Oh. What I would like to see is um, an approach more similar to what's in the uh, client ID draft, which is it starts out by saying, we are going to do something that violates user privacy. Right, yeah, here I, I like that text, yeah. Here are the things we can do. Um, so one is about the, the tone of the draft and considerations. The other thing I'd like to see in terms of the protocol is that, for, that this explores other ways to do this that mitigate the monitoring within the protocol. So for example, this is supposed to be between trusted proxies and yes. servers. So you have a relationship with that proxy. So it would be nice to explore how to do this by, for example, encrypting this data with pre-shared keys as opposed to just assuming it's gonna go clear text. So right. I think that should be part of the design considerations and we should aim for a design which mitigates the monitoring and only if we don't think we can do that with protocol design we would fall back to doing that. That sounds like you guys need to talk about text. Yeah. 
right? Sorry? But, yeah. That sounds like this turns into a discussion of adding text. The, the, shorthand, send text. Yes. 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 But okay. I would like to see both those considerations uh, acknowledged before the group considers yes. adopting okay. it. Okay. Thank you. And I'm, I'm closing the mic. Line. This Warren, is DKG. Um, Sarah Dickinson said everything I wanted to say. Thank you, Sarah. <laughs> I, I concur. Okay. Yeah, Warren Kamari, one of the authors on the EDNS client subnet document. There's some text in there which I couldn't find quickly scrolling on my phone, which largely said, if we had been designing this protocol today, we probably wouldn't have done it because, you know, we've learned more about privacy and stuff like that. So, yeah. Hmm. Okay. Interesting. Yeah, yes. that's interesting. Okay. No, thank you. I think that's, that's good input. Okay. Warren, I think it's you. Oh, no, it's, it's Mr. Uh, Lawrence. David Lawrence for the remote speaking on extended errors. And this is a brand shiny new draft, right? Uh, you, was it? We republished on the third. Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> It no. is not yet a working group document. It is, of course, published just before the deadline, so I'm sure you're all well informed and highly up to date on it. Um, so basically, oh, this thing is close. <laughs> um, so uh, I believe, it, so I just got signed on recently. The original uh, author, the four authors, Warren and Wes and Roy and Evan, had uh, proposed uh, a 16 bit error code that could be used in an EDNS zero option to provide additional information about the source of an error. I think the original motivation was driven by this problem where you could have DNSSEC fail and you don't know why it failed. And so the very first two proposed codes were both re directly related to DNSSEC, where you could either have a, that the actual validation failed, or perhaps it was indeterminate because you didn't have a trust anchor that told you um, how it should uh, that how it should have established a chain of trust. Uh, then also there was the lame answer, which is because currently we overload in many instances the refused R code to e either indicate a policy refusal by the server or perhaps that the zone is not actually hosted on the server. This was the response you may remember in the olden days, we actually used to return a referral to the root and that was determined to be too much of an easy amplification and message size and so servers started returning refuse, but that overloaded the other existing meanings of what refused was supposed to be. Uh, there is also a, a prohibited response specified in here um, that for some reason this, this is the other meaning that for refused. And then there's a question that might perhaps be a bad idea that it, uh, a too busy error code might be something that would be useful to signal say if you were under very heavy load from a DOS or something. Um, and so this would create another IANA registry for code points, uh, but at the moment it's just these five that are presented. Uh, we have a couple of feelers out to people to find out what other codes would be useful straight out of the gate and that invitation extended to all of you. If you have uh, an idea of something that would be really useful in, in this, uh, please go ahead and send to the list. There was also a question about maybe should it just be a generic. One of the things that this signals that the existing DNS protocol does not signal is uh, whether you should retire your query or not. For example, under a validation failure, contacting a different server probably not helpful. Um, under other error code conditions, it might in fact, like perhaps you serve fail, but you have reason to believe because you didn't have a data file you expected to have, but you, you know, your secondary might have that information. And so you could serve fail and then set the bit that says, you know what, this is probably worth retrying this query. But at the moment, there's no particular way, like all of the retry bits are attached to one of those specific error codes that were on the previous slide. There's no way to just kind of generically say, you know what, I don't have an answer for you, but retry. Mm -hmm. And there were additional questions about whether to have, uh, you know, explanatory test, text that would explain the error code uh, that you might want to then, you know, present, poke upward through the UI somehow, exposed through logging. Uh, and there was also a question about whether this is currently called extended error and right now it's only used if your R code is an error R code, perhaps it should be extended to be able to be used in any situation. And there's an additional question that uh, right now the way EDNS works is you're only supposed to ever include an EDNS option in a reply if it was received in the query. 
However, by the original specs that say you're supposed to understand, you know, additional records, and if you don't understand a particular record in the additional section, you just ignore it. There is also a belief that you could maybe push an EDNS option back in a reply, even if you didn't get it in the original query. Whether that should be pursued as a separate, you know, question and not necessarily in this doc is something else. Uh, but overall. We are interested in having it picked up as a working group document and move forward with this mechanism for providing extended information about errors. And we're doing questions, so. Follow-ups. So, so my but biggest concern before, here is that. Actually, before we, we start um, with comments, again, because, because this is a, a, an older draft that's just recently been revived, um, we do want to hear real quick takes on it, but also I think for everybody who's in the mic line, we're going to assume that you're going to review, you're committing to reviewing it because these 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 questions are the right ones and yeah. they need to be they need to be answered. So what we're really looking for at this stage is 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 yeah. review. And I'm calling on our secretary to take down well, take I, down I, all I the think, names as they speak. Uh, oh, okay. uh, oh, I will also emphasize though that I believe even though it's an old document, it was never adopted as a working group item originally. So right, and this is what I'm saying is that people have either not seen it before or not seen it. Recently, so the it was first step I think a is week to get ago. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So go okay. ahead, please. Paul Vargas. So my biggest concern is that we're using signaling bits to convey certain error codes while they're not protected by anything security-wise. Very reasonable point. Paul Over from Cloudflare. Uh, David, this is not new. People have wanted something like this forever and ever. I had a proposal from last century that I just put in the Jabber room. Uh, yeah, this is great. We should talk about how to do it. And sometimes people want more visibility into it when they are the vendor versus what the public gets. Yeah, right. Jim Reed, what all of us said, I think it's a great idea and it's something that's long, long overdue. Got one or two concerns and just a couple of things we can think about when we actually get down to work in this document. First of all, maybe we want to have some kind of lightweight code point allocation policy like we do with our R types, maybe some expert scrutiny if we need to do that. We should also be very, very careful about error codes that are returned in this proposed format that cause changes of behavior in the, re the recursive servers. Because if you've got things like backtracking or if you get a validation failure, let's go and try some other server or something like that, that could be a bad thing. But that's implementation detail. I think right. it's a great idea, long overdue. Okay. And so one quick thing I want to address and one thing you said there is as far as a lightweight allocation policy, and I'll end up mentioning this in my next talk as well, um, that uh, Suzanne, Warren, and I are all working with IANA to try to clarify how we have a couple of registries in the DNS already, and I won't go into too much detail on this, but that where policy um, for code point allocation is through expert review, and we're working on clarifying how it works for those existing registries, and I think there's text in the document already proposing that this be expert review, but that will be tightened up to explain what that review might look like. Okay. In short, I support this, we'll review, but beware, it needs a lot of work first on the protocol and then on the client side, which is always the problem, because yeah. if nobody's reading it, why the hell we are spending time on it? So yeah. Beware. Yeah, Chalak, NS1, I definitely support this draft. Uh, I support adding some extra information about uh, about a failure. I don't like like having error code in header, EDNS uh, option, like extended error code and some other code point. So I'm just asking if there is a space for uh, maybe vendor specific uh, error, uh, like a textual information that would be readable to the client even without like uh, reading any code point and then matching it against some registry. Yeah, I agree that with 16 bits of error space, we shouldn't actually be able to block off a range of vendor specific codes. Uh, like the idea will support review. I think it could also be useful for other uh, result codes than error. And uh, I mean, I don't think we should do it for non-EDS requests. And I mean, the other thing that Paul mentioned is right, we need to look at security-wise, I mean, this unencrypted data, how to deal with that. Okay. I would also uh, like to say, Ralph, thank you for actually supporting something I'm associated with. <laughs> Get out of my box. Um, so send any uh, you know other error codes you can think of to the list so that we can add them to the draft. And Yes. Come say it, Warren. Come say it. You want to, you're dying to. 
So when this was written, most of the point was, you know, specifically debugging type information, additional sort of advisory information. Um, so if you get back serve fail, um, and this leads you down the wrong path because somebody's fiddled with the answer, I don't think it's a huge security thing. You're just going to be confused about where, but I don't think it should actually break stuff. But I haven't thought about it deeply, right? Made up of the plan. Dan, you work as Jabberscribe. The people remote are saying that the audio levels are low, so speak up when you okay. come to the mic. Okay. Thank you, Dan. Thanks, Dan. Um, um, anyway, so uh, our illustrious chair, as I think specifically Tim, has suggested that this is the uh, bad idea fairy session. And so this is the bad idea fairy draft with the unfortunate aspect that uh, this is already implemented and out on the network, not by us, actually. Uh, and so I don't even remember how I organized this slide. I suppose I should look at it. But the main thought that I want to communicate here is my primary concern about uh, advancing this draft is the fact that it's obviously PII, where obviously, you know, it goes beyond client subnet. Here is the full identifier of a person making a DNS query and a request. And I had my own misgivings about, like, well, can this be done? In part, because it's already being done by several vendors. Um, and some of it going across the wide area network. And so my approach to this was much like my approach to client subnet in that documenting existing practice and perhaps improving on it was probably the better approach to take than just let it continue to lurk in the shadows. But I will right up front admit my own discomfort with the privacy aspects of this. Um, the goal of it is really um, based around uh, providers, internet service providers primarily, actually uh, being able to enable filtering on DNS requests. And so it is meant to be used between a client network and their full service resolver and not sent out to authorities. Uh, the document attempts to address this, perhaps not to sufficient uh, detail, but it does make it at least an initial attempt at doing it. There, uh, as, as mentioned here, it is already used on the network. And so the big question is, do we document existing practice, try to improve on it, or just say, well, no, this is a terrible idea and we're going to pretend it doesn't exist. Personally, I don't think that's a really good option. Uh, I did incorporate feedback. I sent this out after having sent it to both to DNSOP and Depriv to say, hey, look, there's this PII draft that's out on the network and not getting any feedback. I sent it explicitly to both Ted, our privacy maven, and to uh, Sarah Dickinson, who did provide some useful feedback on it. And I do want to explicitly say that neither one of them were supporting the draft. They just provided feedback about how it might be less terrible. Um, I also asked for an EDNS code point under the expert review process, and it was denied on the grounds that it was too complicated because it, quote, created a registry of sub-options. Uh, and reportedly, it would have been granted if it had just asked for multiple distinct options. Now, I want to say, without regard, this is not the expert review process needs improvement. And this is not a complaint about our expert reviewer who didn't have sufficient guidance about you know, what should be considered in granting an EDNS zero option code. Uh, it had a lot to do with the UI of how you even initiate the process and then what you would should expect out of the process with regard to any criteria that might grant it or not. Um, and so even though I disagree with our expert reviewer on the grounds for it being denied, at the moment that's what it is and I'm okay with that. Um, but as I mentioned in the previous talk, Suzanne, Warren and I are all, and Tim are all working uh, with Michelle from the IANA to improve this process and we've already seen some of those improvements like now if you go to the IANA registry it will point you at least to the documents that say oh this is how the expert review process was established to whatever degree it might not really have any uh, sufficient documentation to establish your expectations at least you know how to begin the process um, and so oh, oh, um, I didn't mention my co-author's name, unfortunately, at the beginning. Robert Lick, the charter, started this process with us because he had the option to use one of the existing code points, but he felt uncomfortable with it not being part of the visible standards process and wanted, you know, even though we have some software that will go ahead and talk one of the existing options, we wanted really to focus on how can we do this in a right and honorable way if it can be done in a right and honorable way. And so to that end, 
the ultimate goal here is to get it adopted as a uh, working group draft and everything that Sarah said about XPF applies here as well. Um, you know, the, those points are very well taken by me. Nonetheless, my opinion is that I'd like to see it move forward in a way, a respectable way. I will mention though, the flip side of it is, if the working group doesn't adopt it, we don't make it a public standard. I know our we're going to implement it anyway. For the purposes that Charter wants, we're going to implement it using one of the existing option codes because that code is already there. And we actually have within our organization something I can't say too much about, but essentially they need an opaque token that is supposed to be sent across the wide area network. And if you've read the draft, you see that you know we demand that this be you know protected through a, like a TLS channel or some other kind of secure resolution process, which would not expose the data. And what until we move forward with this draft, what they were planning on doing was basically co-opting OpenDNS's code and using that. And if this doesn't go anywhere, they're going to co-opt OpenDNS's code and use that. <laughs> so the reality, once again, facing the DNS, not just DNS off, but the IETF in general, is how do you balance the competing interests of wanting to do the right thing on the network with the understanding that if you don't do something, it's going to happen anyway. I have the best seat in the house. It's right next to my <laughs> So, Paul so, uh, sorry, Paul Rogers. So, so people came to us, to the working group, and said, "We need this, you know, EDNS subnet. You know, we've deployed this already, and you know, uh, uh, we're just documenting running code." And we said, "We really don't like that, but fine." And now you're coming back and saying, "We have running code." Um, uh, it's actually worth just saying we will write running code no matter what you do, so uh, please adopt this. And I think it's time to actually put a foot down and say, well, not further, like, we should, because, because a year further, you're back again with more privacy uh, disabling features. Like, like, we should stop doing this. Sarah Dickinson. Um, so I want to applaud all the efforts that are going on to document what's being done regardless of what we do because that's really important, because people, uh, a lot of technical people are completely unaware that this kind of thing is happening on the wire. So as a minimum, I would like to see us at least do an informational draft to document what is being done. Oh, sorry. Um, so as a minimum, I would like to see us document uh, informationally what is being done, what is really, really happening out on the wire, because that in and of itself is compromising users' privacy. Whether or not we you know, um, do any further work, I think that, I'd like to see that sort of as part of our role. Um, I also like the way the draft is written currently because it, try, it does acknowledge the problems around this. It tries to talk about uh, some of the principles around exposing this kind of information, making it opt-in, uh, doing it over TLS. Um, I'd also like to think that we as a working group could constructively try and help solve these problems if we can in a privacy-preserving way. If we, if we don't think we can do that, that's when we come to the um, debate that um, places like, hey, TLS and Quick are having all the fun of, you know, these massive um, fun fights over this sort of thing. But I think we need to be very careful about where we draw that line because I think we want to be doing everything we can to do both of the things, which is preserve user privacy and provide usefulness on the network. So I think we should be at least exploring this. Okay. I'm closing the mic line and again, suggesting that everybody in the mic line is now committed to reviewing the document. Hello, Peter van Dijk, Power DNS. Uh, at least four people in this room, probably more, are doing this today on squalid points. Please adopt. Thank you. Uh, Ralph Weber, no, I'm, I'm going to surprise you. I'm, I'm supporting a second draft. <laughs> 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 so yeah, I mean, this uh, is good work needs to be done. Yeah. Uh, Stefan Bartsmeyer, I don't commit for reviewing because I think it would be a bad idea to adopt it. Basically, it raises too many privacy issues, and I especially want to say that Section Two today is really, really weak. Uh, suggesting that it has to be opt-in by the administrator of the network, it's no good. It's uh, privacy should be under control of the user, not the administrator. On giving as an example, uh, the, um, 
uh, uh, reading terms of use and clicking yes I accept is certainly not a reasonable way to uh, uh, accept something it's I mean people click on everything every day it means absolutely nothing so it's a really really bad example and it does not uh, feel good for privacy point of view right uh, so I actually really agree with you on that one of the things I can mention you know as I was trying to make it because the original protocol as it was sent to me saying hey can we work on this didn't have any of this and the question i was trying to address was essentially the situation of well a homeowner trying to establish establish and i might be all wrong about this i'll say that right up front too but a homeowner that you know parents that are trying to establish parental filtering for their children i could see where even they would then go through and enable it on all their children's devices because that's what they're trying to do. And they would go through a very conscious process of doing that. Like in an ideal world, that's what I'd love to see happen. Until their friend with the iPad comes over and is now on the network and everything is just fine and it's not being filtered the way they expected things to be filtered. And I, it, it's a, I agree with you <laughs> very much that I wanna see people make conscious choices in life, not just about their privacy, about their diet, about many, many things in life that don't happen because I click right through you as too. And so it is a problem and I don't have any good answers for how to address that problem. Uh, this is Daniel Khan Gilmore. So the, um, from the ACLU, so uh, I do appreciate the attempt to document privacy violations that are ongoing on the network today. Um, I am uh, disturbed by the eagerness to try to make this more flexible with even more privacy invasive options. The idea that there's a registry of sub options or that there would have been a registry of sub options. I mean, I'm trying to imagine what that is. Social security numbers, credit card information. Well, so, uh, uh, you know, I, so, so, so my question is at what point do we draw the line and say, this information is not actually a reasonable piece of information to continue to retransmit on, on the DNS. Uh, this is, the DNS is not made for this and we should not be transmitting it. Right, and so I'll mention the other aspect of that for those of you who haven't read the draft. Essentially, and this was um, our expert reviewer's concern, and I haven't mentioned him by name because we're still buddies and I'm really not <laughs> upset with him for denying it because he had reasonable grounds on, you know, in his mind. But um, the, essentially it proposes to use address families, uh, so a MAC adder or IP address, OpenDNS uses both of those, for example, um, but then also had the flexibility to use, as it turns out, DNS names have an address family assignment, and so use the address family assignment of a DNS name uh, to be able to indicate essentially a domain name within somebody's control. And as I mentioned, we have a security division product that is really meant to protect people talking, a uh, business client that's in their local coffee shop and is connecting to their secure resolver across the network and being able to send this opaque token, which does not actually fit in the, um, in an address family identifier because it includes actual user identifier. But it's a, a token that is meant to be hidden across a network, it's a security product. Um, but that's where kind of the confusion comes because if it uses a domain name, essentially it's infinitely extensible, right? And so you could put anything under there defining what your personal domain name uses. So. Uh, Paradox. So, so just to, to um, and reply to Sarah, um, unfortunately, outside of the IETF, nobody knows the difference between an informational RFC and a standards track RFC. They just know RFC. So if we document something in an RFC, then that's basically signaling to the world outside of IETF that this is something you should support and implement and it's a standard. So I really want to like push back against that notion. Yeah. Leaving it as a draft is something I could see doing, but publishing as an RFC is basically, in the, in the eyes of the world, a, a stamp by the IETF. So that brings up an interesting point, if I can have two more minutes. One, One more minute really quickly, because uh, really Sus short on time here. Suzanne had asked me to bring this up on the terminology document in the last session, and I just didn't. Um, but essentially, there's, uh, there aren't actually many DNS standards, what the ITF considers the standards. There's a lot of proposed standards, but there's nothing that's actually become a standard and not any of the things that you would expect to be standards. <laughs> and most of those only happened within the past couple of years, the five of them that are. Um, and uh, so one of the problems we also have to face, and, and this became an issue for me recently because I had a situation in the company where 
uh, we had a reverse delegation that had to be assigned through RIPE and it didn't have, but we didn't support TCP on the one server that RIPE connected to. And so they pushed back and said, hey, standards require TCP. And the guy that came to me about it, I said, yes, standards require TCP. And he went and looked up the standard and said, he said, it's a proposed standard, it's not a standard. And I'm like, well, as far as the DNS is concerned, proposed standards are standards, but we should be better about moving things that are proposed standards to being actually standards. Because for that same set of people that think that informational or proposed is a standard, there's another set of people that thinks that informational and proposed are nothing. So somehow we have to really start hardening that. 59 seconds? That's good. Okay. <laughs> well done. And yeah, we have time for one more. No, Robert, I think we got bumped, and I apologize. Um, Shimon, you better be here or else you lose your spot. So. Basically, you're standing between people in bits and bytes, so. <laughs> Use their attention wisely. Okay, so. Uh, uh, this is a proposal about uh, algorithm negotiation in the NSX. And um, so Haya Schulman, who I think some of you know, she's done some work with the NS privacy. She presented at ITF in the past. She did some early work uh, on this uh, uh, mechanism. So she's very much a part of this. And um, uh, this week, uh, Shane Kerr gave me uh, some useful feedback. So I recruited him uh, also, or perhaps tricked him into joining me uh, in this document. So uh, let me try to motivate the proposal by talking about the use case we have in mind. So a zone operator wants to incrementally deploy a new DNSSEC algorithm. And also they don't want to disenfranchise the population of resolvers that don't yet understand or haven't been upgraded to understand the new algorithm. And we know this is going to become an issue in the future, there are new algorithms uh, proposed, being proposed, or already appearing, uh, and we know there's uh, other stuff that's going to appear in the pipeline. So um, what the zone operator can do is deploy both algorithms and then monitor, uh, somehow have a capability to monitor its population of resolvers to figure out when they have been upgraded to uh, support the new algorithm and then withdraw the old one. So some of this can be done today. So the DNS protocol certainly supports signing your zone with multiple algorithms and returning signatures with multiple algorithms in the responses. What it doesn't have is an easy way to monitor uh, when clients um, can, uh, are upgraded to support new algorithms. But there are issues anyway. Zone operators often don't want to unnecessarily load the size of their responses with additional signatures because of a variety of operational problems they cause. And these are all well known. The response may um, end up exceeding the path MTU or perhaps the IPv6 minimum MTU, causing it to be fragmented at the IP layer. And we all know that fragments don't uh, successfully transit the uh, modern internet today because they're often blocked by middle boxes and security devices. The zone operator could, uh, when a response exceeds the path MTU, truncate the message and cause the client to retry uh, with TCP, but that involves uh, an additional round trip, additional latency, and additional processing costs associated with TCP. And perhaps the zone operator hasn't uh, upgraded their infrastructure sufficiently to deal with TCP, uh, DNS over TCP queries on a large scale. So uh, while I was here this week, several people told me, well, you can do this today, you can just, just deploy the new algorithm, because DNSSEC, of course, fails open, so nothing breaks. So nothing breaks, of course, except security, and maybe security is important to you, right? So obviously you lose the benefit of uh, clients being able to authenticate your DNSSEC data. And furthermore, it may end up being a critical problem if you're using Dane applications, which have a critical dependency on, on DNSSEC authentication. So they really can't afford to fail open unless they're entirely, unless the application mode of using Dane is entirely optional or opportunistic. So that dissuades them from deploying or adopting new algorithms. So the proposal here is essentially um, a new option, of course. That's the way we extend the DNS. It allows the client to specify an ordered list of algorithms they both support and, uh, and, and prefer. And the DNS server 
upon receiving this option, can attempt to select the best or strongest algorithm they support in common with the client, and then selectively deliver DNS signatures only associated with that algorithm. So you can read the draft for more technical details. Uh, I know, Susanna, I have way too many slides. These are just for reference, so you can, <laughs> uh, I'm not gonna go through uh, all of them. So we have a couple of proposals, uh, how it can be done and how you can implement algorithm downgrade protection, which will be important if we do this kind of algorithm negotiation. So you can go read those. This would be a relatively simple protocol if DNS were a you know, point-to-point -point client server system. We all know it's not, right? There are caches and other intermediaries in the way. So essentially that problem has to be solved and we've sketched up how to do that in the draft. We have a little bit more work to do to uh, more fully specify the different scenarios and how it works, but essentially, um, to summarize, the resolver will have to keep track of which cache entries are, are associated with signatures from a subset of the algorithms supported, and then if they have a downstream validator that requeries them with algorithms that are not, that they don't have, but which are supported by the authoritative zone, they have to be prepared to refetch them. So uh, I'm gonna just quickly finish before, do you wanna interrupt me with a question? Okay, let me, let me quickly go through the slide. So there's some uh, diagrams here about how the cache management would work. And the other thing that this protocol provides, of course, is uh, if you know what 6975 is, that was the original uh, algorithm, cryptographic algorithm signaling, understanding uh, uh, signaling mechanism, right? Which was standardized and published, but as far as I know, no one actually deployed it. So this protocol actually is a superset of that, so it can provide the same functionality. Um, so a couple of things we plan to do in the future, we're gonna continue working, there's a brand new draft, we're gonna continue working on it a little bit. We might um, add the uh, direction bit in the EDNS option, which is something that uh, I've seen in several drafts that Ray Bellis has uh, his name associated with it. So this is essentially to detect broken devices that without understanding the EDNS option just blindly reflected back to you. And um, before I finish, uh, the other thing we can do is we can decide we don't need to solve this problem we, because we might be able to deal it with it in other ways. So I'm just gonna put a list of the potential other ways we can deal with this problem. We can try to mass migrate the DNS ecosystem onto alternative transports that don't have to deal with this problem. So TLS, TCP, Quick, uh, these guys, uh, I think there was a suggestion by someone on the mailing list that the way to solve this problem is just fix the entire internet so that large UDP fragmented packets work successfully. Uh, personally, I don't think that's realistic, but maybe other people do. But even if it were the case that we could solve this problem, uh, fragments do cause other problems. So Haya has actually written a paper, I think it's a five-year-old paper, called Fragmentation Considered Poisonous, where she demonstrated a bunch of attacks that she mounted on the DNS protocol using fragments. And more recently, and actually long ago in the past, there have been various attempts, even within the ITF, to completely de de deprecate the use of fragments. And if you look at, um, I think, Andre, was it you that mentioned BCP 145 recently? So if you look at the UDP usage gu guidelines that the ITF has published, they say that if you're a UDP protocol, make sure your payload comfortably fits in, inside the path MTU, otherwise you're gonna have problems. And I'm pretty sure if DNS were designed in the modern way, in, in the modern day, it would have had an application layer framing mechanism so that you could fragment and reassemble uh, large packets at the, at the DNS layer. So maybe that's another solution, but that's, that's a pretty big endeavor too, so. Okay, so that's it. So uh, can I quickly ask how many people have read this proposal? Okay, all right. It's a bit more than I expected. Okay, that's great. And uh, so my question is, should we work on this? No, All right. Yeah. Uh, I saw in one slide the Tonkus algorithm, which uh, go back, is a term. It's, uh, so on the, yeah, this going? was before. Uh, no, no, this it is was the first in the text in the, in the at the beginning. You should say the server should uh, use the Tronkus algorithm. I'm afraid there is no agreement about uh, from some algorithm which is uh, stronger. So I propose to change it by uh, most preferred or uh, 
Right. So you're saying there's there's no general agreement about how you would rank algorithms in terms yes. of strength? Uh, yes. Yeah. For, for instance, between the DDSA and the CDSA, uh, right. with a curve in the same size. Yeah. Can't, so, can't say yeah, that, that's a good point. So I agree. So the way to deal with that problem is there's two ways you can do it. You can either have a client driven preference where the yeah. client specifies its ordered list. And it doesn't matter what the server prefers. The server has to pick the most preferred algorithm that it supports from the client's list. That's proposal one that I have documented here. But there's a second proposal where we do the opposite. And maybe this is the way it should really work, because uh, I think a lot of people think that the zone operator, not the client, should be able to dictate its algorithm preferences. After all, it is in the zone operator's interest to have the client pop population authenticate signatures with the strongest algorithm that the zone operator thinks it supports. Uh, it's, but but so, there is nothing like uh, stronger, so yeah. only it can change in time. Yeah, so, so the way, there's another piece needed to make this happen, which is uh, the way that a resolver knows what algorithms uh, a zone supports is pretty easy. You just inspect the signed Great. DSPR set. But you, it doesn't know the order of algorithms that the server um, is inclined to use because there may be some disagreement about how to rank a 3000 bit RSA key versus an ECDSA P256 for approximately the same strength. So the way we're proposing to do that is at the apex of the zone at the authoritative server, we introduce a new RR. You two should talk okay. after right. this. Okay. We'll That's really, okay. okay. You right. two should stop. Okay. Um, this is Andre. Yep. Um, I like this drop, and I wish I think we should work on this. But uh, I have a, one question: If we all move to elliptic curve crypto, is this going to be a problem? Uh, are you asking if we all move to elliptic curve crypto? Maybe we can. Um, send, well, send it depends. I mean, if you move to elliptic curve crypto, uh, there are still algorithm choices, right? So you may have ECDSA P two fifty six deployed, and maybe you want to. Uh, get out of, you want to move to add 255.19 because the former algorithm is tainted by association with, Anna, with, the, with NIST or something, right? So you still may have other reasons to transition to new algorithms. Yes, but I'm asking uh, uh, whether the, the size of the signatures will be still a problem. If it's, maybe it will be small enough to just send them all. It, it's okay. possible. It's, yeah, so I mean, that's, we'll have to measure okay. that, but I think in many cases, it could be a problem, right? With NSEC three, you still have to provide three signed NSEC three okay. records. You can have change of Again, this sounds like something where the, your 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 answer now is send text. Okay, all right. Because we're, be we're actually because we're actually over time now, and I still like to hear from people as to love it, hate it. Should we continue to work on it? Although the fact that we're having substantive discussions tends to argue that people do want to work right. on it. Yeah. But I do want to hear from the rest of the, the line. Good. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> Stefan Bartsmeyer, uh, DNSOP has a great uh, capability of producing internet drafts with new eDNS options, so maybe it would be a good idea to consolidate a bit, and it seems to me that this idea could fit in the DNS capabilities draft by uh, Robert Edmonds. At first glance, it seems compatible, so maybe that's something to consider before deciding to adopting uh, this idea and to discuss on the details. Okay, yeah, that, that's a good idea. I actually can't remember what's in Robert's draft. Yeah, this is a capabilities draft, right? So I'll have to go back and read it, but uh, thanks. I'll, I'll look into that. DNSSEC already is fairly complicated. This makes it a hell of a lot more complicated. I, 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 I don't think that will actually uh, help with the adoption of DNSSEC because we still have huge gaps in kind of DNSSEC adoption. So I'd right. rather, rather work with what we have, which seems to work roughly OK, than to kind of add more complicated stuff that will actually people say, oh, no, these, are, these guys are still thinking about it, maybe not implemented now. Yeah. We couldn't get three out of you, Ralph, could we? No. no. <laughs> OK. Patrick Pacek, he's ethnic. From my perspective, as a resolver implementer, it's a nightmare because it will blow up the number of queries because if you know, just think about this. But, right, sure. Right. I mean, in the beginning it won't. It'll just be a marginal increase. But certainly the cache management is a little bit more complicated, right? Yeah, so, definitely. but 
to some extent, we're already have one foot squarely in this boat because of the client subnet. We're doing kind of the same things with that, right? No, so I'm not and saying discuss it right now. I'm okay. saying just it will have bigger consequences than it seems from the first glance. Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. uh, Andreas Schulze. Um, I like the idea. Um, it introduces algorithm agility to DNS, uh, which is generally a good thing. And I, oh, sorry, uh, I suggest to, to talk to the TLS working group, which had similar problems because of downgrade attacks and, and, mm -hmm. and such stuff. Yeah, sure. Okay. Yeah, so this algorithm negotiation mechanism, proposal two is roughly like yeah. TLS, where the client expresses uh, it's list and the server picks the strongest one. Oh, I'm free you get the last word. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I know All you've been over. waiting for this. <laughs> uh, I'm not going to repeat what I've said on the mailing list, but I think this is a horrible idea. Okay. Uh, the main thing is, like Ralph said, this will uh, actually delay the NSSEC deployment uh -huh. because people will think we're not done with the protocol. And uh -huh. so, to answer your question, when it is safe to deploy an algorithm, we have techniques already, like your has shown us how to detect how much is validatable by what algorithm. So it becomes an operator's choice of when they want to make that cut. It shouldn't be baked into this protocol, making more round trips, making resolvers slower, making resolvers have more memory. It's just, this just smells so bad. There are so many different levels, and I can't believe you are trying to delay Dane with this. Uh, <laughs> well, so, sorry, Oliver, what was okay. the last one? I missed the last oh. one. Because okay. uh, you're causing uncertainty about the NSX deployment, that will delay Dane. That will delay Dane, yeah. Okay. yeah. All right. Okay, so I disagree, but I'm not going to rant now. I'll rant on the list later. <laughs> <laughs> and if you're really lucky, well, if we, there's enough going on, we'll do an interim uh, to, to work out some of these things. But yeah. for now, we are over time. We don't want to impose on, uh, particularly on Mireko. Yeah. But thanks, everybody, for your time. Thanks, everybody, for the good discussion. And we will... See you out there in Radio Land, and we will see you in Singapore. Thank you. Where is that? Yeah. There we go. And for those who missed Robert's talk, that's essentially Robert's talk right there. Oh. <laughs> <laughs>